Captain Marvel, aka Captain Thunder, aka Shazam, is one of the most popular and long-lasting superheroes to come out of the quick, everyone get rich off of Superman gold rush of the 1940s. However, the character's enduring legacy has a secret no one wants to discuss, racism. Dave Baker. Today on Total Nerd, we're going to delve into the racist legacy of Captain Marvel, his co-creator C.C. Beck, and this aspect of his past which is being kept very quiet. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel and leave a comment below. Let us know what Total Nerd topics you'd like us to explain next. Bill Parker and C.C. Beck were the men who fathered the hero who would eventually be known as Captain Marvel, or Shazam, depending on where in the timeline you're hailing from. Writer Bill Parker, at the behest of his boss, executive director Ralph Dei, was tasked with creating a character that would have special abilities that were linked to six mythological figures. Parker took this and ran with it, which is how you get Shazam being Billy Batson's secret code word. Billy Batson, a seemingly perennially alone little kid, discovers a cave with a wizard in it who grants him a special ability, and all he has to do is speak the wizard's name, Shazam. This transforms the boy into an adult superhero named Captain Marvel, or Captain Thunder, as he was originally, you know, called, but there was already a character called that, so, you know, Captain Marvel! The character became wildly popular due to his amazingly simple and effective wish fulfillment device. If you didn't notice, the character is almost one-to-one -one a Superman ripoff, like many characters from this day and age were. However, Captain Marvel quickly skyrocketed up the charts, outselling the Man of Steel before anyone could say, look, up in the sky, it's a totally legal character that's made to coast off the success of Superman, but will eventually end up bankrupting Fawcett Comics. More on that later. C.C. Beck, or Charles Clarence Beck, was born in Zumbrata, Minnesota on June 8, 1910. He's quoted in interviews as saying, It was a place that Walt Disney would have loved. Which, if you know anything about Walt Disney, you're already bracing for the other wildly problematic shoe to drop. His mother was a school teacher, and his father was a preacher. At 23 years old, Beck landed a job as a staff artist for Fawcett Comics, a third-tier publisher who ostensibly made its bread and butter ripping off whatever current trends were happening. In an era of literal sweatshops, like the Eisner Iger Studio churning out comics on an assembly line basis, craft was not something that many people deliberated over. Comics of the 1930s and 1940s were disposable cultural detritus. They just made them, and then they shoved them out the door as quickly as possible. Beck, however, showed an immense talent that blossomed over his time at Fawcett. He developed a clear and concise method of storytelling, a charming sense of anatomy, and a razor precise style that honestly is still being imitated a half century later. One of the most brilliant aspects of his cartooning is how he approaches character design. They say the eyes are the window to the soul, right? Well, look at how Beck communicates his character's central dynamic with just four lines. He always draws Billy Batson with dot eyes. He's innocent, untainted, he's open to the world. The circle is a perfect representation of this. Captain Marvel on the other hand, is usually drawn with arched lines for his eyes, like he's squinting, or like his eyes are being forced closed because he's just smiling so hard. Even when he's not smiling, it's like he's consistently smizing. This conveys a subliminal being an adult is fun paradigm to the reader, which is basically what the whole book is literally about. It's a power fantasy, it's wish fulfillment, it's letting kids aspire to be just and honorable and honestly just to have fun as an adult. And that adulthood isn't scary, it's positive and it's safe and it's easy to do the right thing and be a good person. You know, as long as you're white. Quickly, Captain Marvel became the flagship character of Fawcett Comics, so much so that they built his supporting cast out with iterative characters and companions. Otto Binder, one of the most highly regarded Captain Marvel writers, had a narrative approach of more is always better. He was one of the people who pushed for characters like Captain Marvel Jr., Miss Marvel, Uncle Marvel, Talkie Tawny Tiger, which is basically what if Captain Marvel was just a talking tiger, like the name would imply. I know what you're thinking, and this looks like the same playbook that the Superman family has, right? Superboy, Supergirl, Crypto, all the way down the line. Well, that's because most of these characters were also created by Otto Binder, copying his own Captain Marvel playbook. At one point, Fawcett was publishing Captain Marvel Adventures, Captain Marvel Jr., Captain Marvel Family, Wiz Comics, and WoW Comics simultaneously, which all featured Captain Marvel, which leads us to the highly regrettable and much maligned Steamboat. 
Steamboat Bill, or as he's more commonly referred to, Steamboat, is a supporting character in many of Marvel's early Fawcett-era comics. He's commonly referred to as a valet of Captain Marvel and his teen alter ego, Billy Batson. He's also commonly referred to as The Boy, which, you know, just isn't okay, but nothing about this story is okay. Steamboat's depiction is objectively offensive, with stylized facial features reminiscent of Sambo caricatures and a buffoonish nature. Steamboat was obviously intended to be the brunt of the jokes within the books. However, Beck claimed that Steamboat was created in an attempt to appeal to African-American readers. But like, was he? I don't know. I don't really buy it. Look at this speech pattern. Everything about this just feels like punching down. Steamboat's first appearance was in America's Greatest Comics number two, and he would run through almost all the Fawcett-produced Marvel Family books. In 1945, the displeasure over Steamboat's presence in the books rose to a fever pitch. A group of integrated students approached the Fawcett editorial department and arranged a meeting with them to discuss their concerns. Ultimately, Fawcett actually listened, and they stopped using Steamboat. Steamboat is bad. And you know what's equally as bad? Billy Batson donning blackface to get on a ship of refugees in Wiz Comics number 12 from 1941. I mean, what more do you need to say? Blackface? It was a thing of the time? No, no. It was just awful. And it's offensive. And look at these word balloons. Bill Parker and CeCe Beck are making Billy speak in a super offensive accent. No. Just no. Captain Marvel The Monster Society of Evil is the first long-form superhero story told in North America. It was serialized over two years, from 1943 to 1945. It took place in Captain Marvel Adventures 22 through 46. This is notable for multiple reasons. If you've never read a comic book from the Golden Age, you might not be familiar with the fact that every comic is split up into eight-page chunks, and that usually you get three or four eight-page stories with different characters having adventures per issue. They're complete, the beginning, middle, and end, each one of these stories. Eight pages. Done. They don't really connect, and they don't really reference anything outside of what's happening in those eight pages. And they don't usually spill in between issues. Captain Marvel was the comic that literally invented how the majority of superhero stories would be told over the next 70 years. Otto Bender and C.C. Beck basically built the template for every superhero comic book you've ever loved over the course of these 25 issues. It's a landmark achievement, and it pushed the boundaries of what the medium of comics is capable of. And it's also horribly racist. Surprising to no one watching this video, Otto Bender and C.C. Beck played into the racism and rampant anti-Japanese sentiment that was rising due to the tensions surrounding the Second World War. These issues often present dehumanizing characterizations and individuals that are literally buck tooth and colored bright yellow. You'd think when a group of people show up at your office and are like, hey, maybe don't be kind of a dick, maybe like just less of a dick, please? That as a creator, you would try and listen to that and maybe try to be slightly less dickish. However, that didn't happen. In fact, the book was so mired in the way that it hinges on race that it has never been reprinted. Yeah, never. It's literally a foundational element of superhero fiction, but the racism involved in it has kept it in the shadows and out of the public eye. And here's where we get to the part in the story where it all comes crashing down. Surprisingly, not because of the racism. Because the books were too successful. People in the 40s, man, they loved racism. DC didn't like being bested by Fawcett, so they sued for the copyright of Captain Marvel. And after a protracted legal battle, which ended in a settlement of Fawcett basically just agreeing that they wouldn't publish Captain Marvel any longer, Fawcett went bankrupt. Eventually, DC bought all of Fawcett's assets and chose not to publish Captain Marvel comics anymore. Why would they? Well, they've got Superman. Beck couldn't find any more comics work at this time and ended up working as a commercial illustrator and an engraver for a greeting card company. Obviously, like many of the creators during this time, he didn't have any financial windfall from any of the adaptations or spin-off books that had been spawned from Captain Marvel, so he worked for a few other illustration companies and they all seemed to really like his simple, clean, elegant illustration style. And he slowly started fading into obscurity. Two and a half decades later, DC Comics decided to revive Captain Marvel to coincide with the Captain Marvel TV show titled Shazam! Why was the new Captain Marvel reboot book and show titled Shazam, you ask? Well, in the intervening two and a half decades, the copyright for the title Captain Marvel had lapsed, and Marvel Comics had stepped in and started creating a new Captain Marvel. The character's name was still Captain Marvel at this point, but legally the book had to be titled something else. 
Thus, the book being called Shazam, the character being called Captain Marvel. In a surprising twist, DC approached Beck to illustrate the new title, which obviously he accepted. Let me just stop here for a minute and just drill down. Joe Shuster, the man who co-created Superman, was never brought back to do Superman, ever, after he left the company. Bob Kane, who erroneously received credit for creating Batman, never returned for any meaningful reboot of Batman. These companies were cut through and they had no sense of goodwill for the creators that made these enduring and beloved iconic superheroes. So for them to go to Beck and ask him to return is almost unprecedented and just goes to show you the skill and the talent that this man possessed. DC wanted his blessing on the reboot and they knew that the only one who could really, really execute Captain Marvel as an artist was CC Beck. Besides, smizing is hard to draw, man. It's hard. Have you ever tried it? You know, little, little, well, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to do. Like, can you imagine trying to, it's hard to do, let alone draw. When asked about his return, Beck said, eh, they talked me into illustrating the first few issues of the revived Captain Marvel comic. But I gave up when I realized that the stories were structureless, meaningless, and totally worthless. Oof. Ouch. So, here's where we reach the end of our road. The issue at stake is complex and intricate. How do we separate the art from the artist? Or do we? How do we evaluate the master craftsman's work while at the same time not giving credence to his repugnant and virulent racist past? One way to think about this is, over the course of his life, did C.C. Beck mature and grow past these sins? Did he attempt to make amends for the work that he had made that was obviously out of ignorance and had harmful effect? Well, in a phone interview with Tom Hinges in the 1980s, the 1980s, mind you, Beck said the following. I don't feel comfortable reading this full quote, so I'm just gonna let you read it and then you can draw your own conclusions. Ooh. That really doesn't seem like someone who's done even the slightest amount of soul searching. Another thing to keep in mind when you're having this conversation is, did the artist in question actively keep perpetuating the objectionable behavior throughout the rest of his career? Or was it isolated to a specific time period? Well, unfortunately, throughout the 1970s, Beck made a living selling recreations and commissions based off his previous work. Meaning, he would redraw or paint an iconic image from a Captain Marvel comic from the past. And, you know, get a load of this image. That's from 1974. 1974. Ugh. No. What is he doing? I've also found this illustration online. It's literally the same drawing, but with you know who altered. So, which one of these is the original? Which is a drawing that Beck actually made, and which was one that was digitally altered by a contemporary artist or a fan? That happens, right? The internet's a crazy place. Well, the original illustration is from the cover of Wiz Comics 59 from 1944. It was also reproduced in the back of the issue as a contest to see how many readers could identify the Marvel family characters. And after doing some internet hunting and with some help from people like Jim Thompson from the Comic Book Historian's Facebook group, I'm fairly confident in saying, unfortunately, the racist one is the recreation that Beck did in fact create, which is a bummer, because I want people to grow and learn and be better, but... In closing, C.C. Beck is a figure that's contributed in massive amount of ways to the history of comics and the medium itself. He was a gigantic talent and an iconic figure in its heyday in the 1940s. He also had a massive resurgence later in life, which is just, it doesn't happen in comics. However, his personal beliefs and cultural blind spots cast a long shadow over his legacy and over Captain Marvel's. His contemporaries like Will Eisner, Hergé, and many others also struggled with the aberrant racism that was so prevalent in the 1940s. However, most of the people that he was contemporaries with that did create objectionable work, they apologized later in life. They attempted to make amends or to rectify the situation. Eisner created Fagin the Jew, which is his answer to the entire conversation around awful depictions of minority characters. Hergé spent a long time producing work that was a direct reaction to his early missteps with books like Tintin in Tibet and The Blue Lotus. To make things even more complex, as previously stated, the Monster Society of Evil has never been reprinted. Should it be? Or should it remain inaccessible forever? I don't know. There's an argument to be made that it's a crucial piece of art history, and with a proper forward explaining the large swaths of the content that are morally repugnant, that it should be put out today. 
There's another argument that it's needlessly bigoted and that those aspects of the work completely eclipsed any artistic value that the work had held previously. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know how I feel about both, the Monster Society of Evil and Beck as a creator. His place in comics history seems to be dwindling every year. Perhaps justifiably so. However, I would point out that Breakfast at Tiffany's is heralded as a classic and a high point of Audrey Hepburn's career. And every freshman film school has to watch The Birth of a Nation. Well, what do you think? Does Beck deserve to have his contributions to the medium forgotten due to his seemingly unrepentant nature? Should DC reprint The Monster Society of Evil? Will you ever look at Captain Marvel, aka Captain Thunder, aka Shazam, the same way again? If you like this video, please comment below and let us know what other areas of nerd culture need an explainer. And in the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.